Amen. Amen. Can anybody say that they're happy in the Lord this morning? Oh, come on. Come on. Say it like you mean it. Is anybody happy in the Lord this morning? Happy that you made it this far in the year of 2015. Some folks you started the year with, you, they are not going to finish it with you. Oh, I'm happy. I'm happy. And I'm and I'm greatly happy to uh, be here this, uh, this morning. Um, those of you who do not know, my name is Derek. It's been that way my whole life. My parents kind of just gave it to me and I had to run with it. They, uh, they, they even spelt it wrong, but you know, that's, that's got nothing to do with me. That's, that's just how it works. Uh, I don't even know why I said that. That's just, that's just, that's just my life. Uh, <laughs> Well, I just want to thank uh, just uh, all of you. I want to thank the, uh, the uh, great pastor of this great church, Reverend, uh, Reverend, Reverend Braxton. I want to thank uh, the uh, mu uh, musicians and the uh, worship team here. I want to thank also just the ushers. You all are doing a great job in your red. Just go and look at, the, look, at, look at that red. Yeah, you're looking good. Hey, um, well, uh, for uh, those of you uh, who uh, don't know anything about me, I'll tell you a little bit of something else. I'm the favorite in my family. That's just, that's just how, it, how it works, too. You Derek in the favorite. That's, that's just that's how it, No, my, uh, so this is how I tell this story all of the time, and it is like this, right? Now, my, now my mother and, you know, father, they were trying to have a perfect child, and they came up with my sister. You know, she's the, uh, she's the uh, Otis, you know, that's actually right her, right over there in the yellow, in, in the yellow, yep, say hi, that's her, right? Yep, no, don't clap yet because you haven't finished hearing my story. <laughs> they try to come up with the perfect child, you know, and they're, and they're like, we should have the, a perfect child. And so they said, all right, we're going to start with my uh, sister. And they said, oh, okay, I think we could do better. And then, <laughs> and then they... And then they tried again, and then they got to my brother, you know, who's the uh, second oldest, and they said, oh, we're getting, we're getting close, you know. And then they got to me, and they said, ah, finally. <laughs> finally, we have arrived at the central edifice of what it means to be a perfect kid, <laughs> right? Now, my sister tells that story in the opposite direction. She says, well, actually, uh, what had happened was is that they started with the perfect child, and they said, hey, this is really good. Let's try to do it again. And then it started getting worse and worse. And when it got to me, they said, let's stop. Let's stop while we're ahead. So, uh, so I am the, uh, the youngest of, uh, of three. Another little piece uh, about me is that I absolutely love the Christmas season. I mean, Christmas for me, it is, it is an amazing season. It is a time in which we get to see that God is literally not, not, and not, uh, not uh, metaphorically, but God is literally with us. For that is the very nature and the meaning of the name of Jesus. Emmanuel, it is God, is with us. And I want to tell you this today, that in the midst of your despair, in the midst of whatever your circumstances, and even in the midst of your joy and of your triumph and of your highest height, you have a God that is with you. And that is the good news of the Christmas story. You see, for me, Christmas, Christmas uh, for me as a professing b believer is, is centered upon he who is the hope of the world. Christmas marks the four-way intersection into life, death, uh, hope, and despair. It is the culminating event that is foretold by the prophets of the old and, and realized in a manger in Bethlehem. But it hasn't always been that way for me. You see, when I was in the uh, sixth grade, the Christmas story meant something completely different. The, the, uh, the uh, Christmas story was not necessarily a story about how great God was, but rather it was mainly a story about how awesome those presents are, but then also how, uh, how embarrassed I was. Now, let me see if I can just explain this a little bit. You see, so I was in the sixth grade, and I had this teacher by the name of Miss Garrett, or rather Miss, Miss Lindback, and you'll see why I made that mistake is because Miss Limbeck uh, got, got, got married about halfway through the, uh, the uh, year. And so we had to try to figure out what her name was and what we were going to call her and Miss Garrett and Miss G and Miss Limbeck and all that kind of stuff, right? And she came up with this great idea that she thought was absolutely brilliant. She came up with this, with this idea that she thought would be a great way to bring in and to usher in this new year. And she was, I imagine, was maybe sitting down one day watching The Grinch 
or something and said, uh, and said, aha, that's what I'm going to do. And she came up with this idea to test the reading abilities of all of her students by having her students choose a book of their own ch choosing and then have to read that book to the entire class. Now, some of you are like, all right, Derek, well, that's a pretty normal thing, right? All right, that's, that's pretty natural, right? No, no, it's not. Because if you're like me, that, that causes anxiety, right? See, I had this thing called a reading deficiency. Uh-huh, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. What a reading deficiency is, is when the rest of the classroom is sitting out, hanging out, you know, doing their own thing. You and your teacher got a, sig got a signal in which you give to one another, and it's time for you to get up and leave and go to 702. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. So, so Miss Garrett, Miss Lim, Miss Limbeck would be like, "Hey, uh, Derek, can you go help the principal stack those papers?" I'm like, "Okay, okay, all right, right." And there I go around the corner to room 702, and that's how it worked. But then it was also for for uh, for for me. One of the reasons why I didn't, you know, like enjoy this whole kind of moment too was because I also had this thing called a speech impediment. Right. I had I had this stutter. In today, I still have it. I'll stutter on things like P's and and G's and. and uh, S's and the rest of the 24 letters, <laughs> you know, um, but, but, but I'm okay with that, right? You know, I'm fine. I'm fine. That's, that's just kind of what I got to deal, deal with, right? But, but Miss Limbach came up with this great idea and she said, you know what, this is going to be good. And so I did what any sixth grader would do in this moment. I realized that my social capital <laughs> was hanging on my ability to pull this off. And I did what any sixth grader would do in this moment. I said, well, I guess I just got to I guess I just got to memorize the whole book, word for word, front to back, cover to cover. And I did it. I did it. I did. Now, hold on a second. I know what some of y'all are thinking. You're like, oh, I, I need to take this man to Vegas. We're about to count all the cards. We're going to, hey, Jesus, we will, we will tie 10%. You will get, you will get 10% of everything. But Miss Limbach, you know, so there, so, uh, so uh, there I was. I memorized the whole book. But before you get all caught up in it, the book that I chose to remember was The Night Before Christmas. It was The Night Before Christmas. And I would study it for hours and hours, days and days, and I would go on and on and on with it. And then I even remembered, and so I also even remembered when to flip and to turn the pages. And so I would, you know, practice the pinky and the thumb. Come on, come on, the pinky and the thumb where you put the book inside the pinky and the thumb and you scan it across the room like one of these and you flip it again and you scan it across, right? And so there I was now sitting in class and I said, it was the night before Christmas. <laughs> when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. And the stockings were hung by the chimney with care and hope that St. Nicholas soon would be there. And Ma and her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. And out on the lawn there arose such a clatter and I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. And the story keeps going, right? And I tore open the shutter and I threw open the sash. And uh, what to my wandering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a whimsical driver so lively and quick. I knew in a moment it must be saying, I still know the whole poem, right? You know, and, and then at the end of that, I said, I did it. I pulled it off. I killed it. I, I did it. All those, I, 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 I didn't have to worry about none, none of that, right? I was like, hey, I did it. I did it, right? And then I looked back, and I could see Miss Slimbeck in the back of the classroom giving me one of these kind of snarling looks. Well, apparently what has happened was is that I forgot to flip the pages. I forgot to flip the pages, <laughs> right? I got, I got caught. I got busted. That was it. Well, what I want to do today, I don't want to simply tell you the story about the night before Christmas. What I want to do is I want to tell you about the story of the night after Christmas. I want to tell you about the story of what happens after, after Christmas. You see, I don't want to talk about the empty polites 
the beautiful rhetoric, the brightly painted pages of the Christmas story. I don't want to talk about the presents underneath the tree and the stockings by the fire. I want to talk about the night after Christmas. I want to talk about the backlash, the aftershock that shook the earth when the Savior descended into the tapestry of the human condition. Let's talk about the messiness that takes place after Christmas. Let's talk about the wrinkled and ripped wrapping paper, the debris that scattered across the floor. Let's discuss the discarded box and the dirty dishes still in the sink. Don't give me the tellings of a, of a whimsical St. Nicholas. M melted is the newly fallen snow. Gone is the poetry, the cadence, the rhythm, and the rhyme. And set before a center stage is the raw, the real, the uncut record of the event. It is a recording of the greatest happening of all of human history. It is the story of when hope and strength enter into the world. It is a testament of resilience and lament. It is the culminating tension and reprieve. And if it was on a television show, I believe that the New York Times would say it's riveting. I believe the Rolling Stone magazine would say that it's nail biting. I believe that People magazine would say it's a must see film. And Newsweek would say that it's tear jerking. We're about to step into the initial pages of the greatest story ever told. And it starts like this in the book of Matthew, in chapter 2, verses 13, it says these words it says, And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so he got up and he took the child and his mother during the night and they, and they left for Egypt. And where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he grew furious. And he gave orders to kill all of the boys in Bethlehem and its end in its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time when he had learned from the Magi. And then what he said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah. Weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And after Herod died, then the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to kill the child, for those who are trying to take the child, child's life, well, they're dead. And so he got up. And he took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was, was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And having been warned, warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said to the prophets. He would be called a Nazarene. You see, essentially what happens is that we arrive at the scene just after King Herod gets word about the birth of someone who was to be crowned king of the Jews. He, he, has, he has asked these three wise men to report their findings once they determine uh, his location. But instead, what they do is they completely do the opposite. They completely go against all of King Herod's rule and all of King Herod's authority and decree, and they simply leave and never return and never say a mumbling word. And then the text then transitions us into the birth where which we are informed that Jesus is born, and Joseph gets a word from the angel of the Lord in a dream telling him, arise and leave Bethlehem at once and head towards Egypt because King Herod seeks to destroy Jesus. Now, in this moment, it's important that we understand that, be that, that before... Um, that before uh, this particular section, and rather in before this particular area of the text, before Jesus was born, there existed this thing called the intertestamental period. And what the intertestamental period is simply in layman's terms means is that it's simply a time of about 400 years between the, ending, between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. And there's this kind of anticipation, right? There's this kind of hope 
that, uh, hey, I'm just going to stand on a last word that God had, had, had given me because I'm hoping for the better and the greater and the Savior coming later. And it is in this intertestamental period what happens is that a man by the name of Alexander the Great has this battle in 332 BCE. And in this battle, he thought about taking siege of Jerusalem. But instead of that, what he does is he decides to go and take siege of Egypt. And then while he's in Egypt, he, he uh, takes, takes over the city called Alexandria, and he makes that a sanctuary and a refuge place for Jews. And so now it is here in this text that an angel of, of the, uh, the uh, Lord says, hey, you, Joseph, go and hide in the sanctuary that I have already pre-established and when I was waiting for you long before you even needed it. Right. Some of us are in particular moments of our life. Well, we're going through some kind of troubles and tribulations, and there's already a pre-established safety net somewhere, somehow. You don't have to worry about necessarily how things are going to look, how things are going to turn out. You simply rely on the vision and on the dream that God has given you long ago, and you just follow the voice of the Lord that says, go. You see... Now, here's another part about this, about this safety net, right? So the safety net called Alexandria, it is essentially 75 miles from the city of Bethlehem into the border of, or rather this safety net of Egypt, right? It's 75 miles from, from Bethlehem to the border of Egypt. That's 75 miles. But to get into the safety net and to get into the sanctuary area that is Alexandria, that's another 100 miles from that 75 miles from out. So essentially what that means is that we have... Jesus, Joseph, and Mary that need to travel 175 miles by foot and maybe by animal, maybe, possibly. And so we see just how far this is really for all of them to actually travel. And so what we see then too, if we look back up to a verse 11 in the same chapter, we see that the Magi had actually given Jesus these gifts, right? You know what the gifts are, they're gift of gold, gifts of frankincense, and gifts of myrrh. And so, and, and so what we see too then is that this gold, right, has of course theological sig significance as do all of these gifts, right? Gold is the symbol of a royalty, right? Frankincense is a symbol of deity. And then myrrh is a, is a, is a, a symbol of humanity. The gold, the, the, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, all of these were used and likely used by Joseph in order for him to be able to make that travel to make that traveling journey into that safety place where God had already, had, already, had already established. And so what we see then too is that this journey for these Jesus, Joseph, and Mary was likely not an easy journey because they had to rely on the gifts things that God had already given them. And, and here's where I want to actually pause too. I want, I want to pause here too. What we see is that what is happening in this text is that Jesus Joseph and Mary are, are, are essentially escaping the tyranny, the tyranny of an evil dictator. I want to parenthetically pause, and I want us to think, to think about this now for a moment. I want us to think now uh, ab about, about this moment and remind you of the fact that Jesus is escaping the execution that King Herod is trying to do on his life. So what does this tell us about Jesus? This tells us that Jesus was actually a refugee. This tells us that Jesus was an immigrant. And so when we hear of the bigoted rhetoric in the words of, 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 of in proposing policies of white supremacists wrapped in the politician's garb, speaking of denying entry to desperate Syrians and distressed Muslims and building up walls to keep Mexicans, which according to the front runner says are nothing but rapists and drug dealers and terrorists, we lose sight of what I believe to be the greatest teachings in our biblical record. And that great teaching is in Galatians 5 and 14 when it says these words, it says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. For the whole of the law is fulfilled in this one word. And that is that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Your neighbor is not just the person that's sitting on the pew next to you. Your neighbor is not the person that lives in a condominium next to you. Your neighbor is not your upstairs neighbor or your downstairs neighbor, but your neighbor is the person across the country and across the world. And your neighbor is the person across the street and your neighbor is the person across the border. He says the whole of the law is fulfilled in this one word. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if, if we really want to get technical about the whole thing, the fact shows us that the greatest and longest running act of terrorism that happened on the U.S. soil has not been in the hands of the foreigner, but it's been in the hands of the domestic policies that has greatly profited the economy of this nation through the 500 years of enslavement of black bodies. If we really want to get technical, We really want to get technical. The terrorist, terrorist acts in, in uh, the, the terrorist acts in Toulouse. Yeah. If we really want to get technical, terrorism is this thing that essentially seeks to put terror into the lives so that one has not this ability to freely be and become. Because we got to understand that we are not just human beings, but we are also human beings. We're also human beings and still humans to become. That's what terrorism seeks to do, to stifle all of that. And so now back to where we were. You see, all that Jesus, Joseph, and Mary simply desired was to live. All they wanted to do was to freely move and have their being. All they wanted to do was just to simply be. Has anyone ever been there? Where, where all you want is just to be able to not be afraid when you get pulled over from the police. Has anyone ever been there in the workplace where all you wanted to do was simply be able to speak your mind without worrying about losing your job? Has anyone in this room ever been there where all you wanted to do was to get your kids into a better school's district, but yet, because of that, someone gets 15 years in prison? And so here, here it is, fighting against their ability to freely be and become. And he wrestles against the will of God rather than participating in the inbreaking of God's kingdom. And from all of this information, what we learn is that we can see that King Herod makes a decree to kill infants. I want you to hear this. King Herod makes a decree, not just children. These are unpotty trained toddlers. King Herod makes a decree to kill every infant and toddler in the city of Bethlehem under the age of two. And so traveling that 175 miles by foot and possibly maybe an animal, it is no easy task. And to be sure that King Herod was able to kill the future king of the Jews, he made the margins a little bit bigger. He realized that that journey would take some time. And so he said, well, well, let's just make sure that we can get them all. So I'm going to extend, and I'm going to extend the age range. Because Jesus would have likely been around the age of one or one and a half by the time that, that the Magi would have arrived at his presence, right? But what King Herod does, he says, let's just make sure that the margins are big enough so that we can capture everybody. And the text gives us insight to the high probability that Jesus' cousins would have been killed. High probability that Jesus' aunts and his uncles would have been murdered. His neighbors and perhaps his grandparents were among the many slain. And we could assume that Herod's men entered into the city and families resisted insofar as they were equipped and trained. 
Fathers fought for the lives of their newborn sons. Uncles and nephews joined in to assist. The women picked up whatever they could to resist, taking with them weapons in one hand and trying to hide their child in the rafter in an alleyway and the other. But at the end of it all, what happens? Bloodshed. Slaughter. And in the reading of this horrific text, we learn why sentimental celebrations of the Christian narrative have little place for shrieking mothers who have to bury their sons. Don't talk to me about the peace on earth and good wills towards men if you're not going to be able to speak to the plight that I'm experiencing right now. Don't push me to hope and restoration if, you, if, 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 if we can't deal with reparations. Don't tell me to live peacefully if the peace that you're asking me to do is simply to step in and slip into the pocket of the status quo. For whose peace is it? While you rest in peace, I rest in pieces. I imagine when I approach this text, I imagine that the mothers actually had more to say than what the writer Matthew gives them. Because if you look at the text, the slaughtering of all of these children only lasts for one verse, for one sentence. But I wonder what would happen if the mothers were able to write that section. Maybe they wouldn't be so quick to move past and on to the next scene. Maybe we would get to learn the children's names. Maybe we would learn some of their favorite foods and the things that they enjoyed, the things that made them laugh, the things that brought, that, 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 that brought great love to the parents. Maybe we, maybe we would get to know if they were able to take those first steps. Maybe we would get to know how much they weighed when they were born. Maybe we would get to know the color of their eyes, the texture of their hair, the hue of their skin, the size of their shoes, what size shirt. Maybe we would get to know a little bit more. And now while this text doesn't specifically speak to the evening hours after Jesus' birth, it certainly speaks to the night-like darkness that filled the landscape of Bethlehem. It's a darkness whose origin is not found in the absence of light. It's a darkness that is not easily frightened or scared away or scattered by a torch or a glowing fire. It is a darkness that seeps into the very thread and fiber and fabrics of the wounded soul. It's a darkness that clings on to you like, like a scared child hanging on to the coattail of his father in the dark. It is a darkness that echoes like, like a delayed shout across the empty and vast Grand Canyon. It is, a deck, it, is a, it is a cry that continues to permeate and saturate the pages of the society around us, the darkness. And from this text, we learned that, that Herod then launches a preemptive strike against any possible attempt to overtake his throne. And our record here reveals that Jesus, oh yes, no, Jesus emerges safe and alive. He emerges from the dust. He emerges from the smoke, the flowing streams of blood. However, 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 he does not emerge untouched. Jesus is touched. I wonder what it would be like for Jesus to walk into a room knowing that he's the only person his age in that generation that would be in that, that, would be in that city. I wonder what it would be like for families to see someone the same age as your child. And that's the only one in that generation. And so in the reading of this text, we learn why we simply cannot talk about peace on earth and goodwill towards men without talking about the broken pieces and the fragmented families that were left to pick up what they had. Now, now make no mistake and hear me clear in this moment. You see, this wasn't the first time that a state governing authority had attempted to wipe out a whole generation from the pages of history. 
And I'm going to tell you this too, it will not be the last. There's a bunch of mothers and a bunch of fathers, sisters and brothers who can relate. No, your sons may not have been hunted by King Herod. No, they may not have been hounded by Archelaus. But you've, experiencing, but you've been experiencing and you've known the soul-crushing blow of the King County criminal justice system. You've known the socioeconomic death sentence of a felony when trying to apply for housing. You've experienced the underfunded classrooms in your inner city communities. You've experienced and you've grown acquainted with the school to prison pipeline. You've heard of the gut-wrenching cries of the mothers. No, 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 not the mothers of Bethlehem. But you heard the gut-wrenching cries of the mothers of Trayvon Martins. And you've heard the gut-wrenching cries of the Michael Browns. And you've heard the gut-wrenching cries of the Tamara Rices and the Ayanna Joneses. And I just want to leave you now with a little bit of hope. Because it is in this very turmoil and in this very struggle and this very utter despair that Jesus walks into humanity. It is in the midst of all of this that we get the testament to the fact that in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your uncertainties, in the midst of your oppression, God is with you. That is the Christmas story. That is what Christmas truly is. For that is what Christmas is about. Gone is the snow. Melted are the snowflakes. Gone are the poetic phrasing of empty rhetoric and paper hearts and platitudes. And the Christmas story tells us this. It teaches us three things. And that is that first God, God is with us. That's the very naming of Jesus. Emmanuel, God is with us. You see, secondly, it shows us that Jesus is not only just with us, but that Jesus is for us. You see, let me see if I can make this point a little bit more clear. Imagine you are in a room with a pit bull, you know, and you say, hey, doggy, you know, Imagine in the room with the pit bull and it's, you know, it's been eating nothing but gunpowder and lifting weights, right? <laughs> and uh, now you know you're with it, but you're going to ask it another question. You're going to say, are you for me? See, because when it's for you, you're able to build relationship, to have connection, to have trust and companionship. But when you're just with it, you're going to continue to tiptoe around and see if you're going to step on any eggshells or maybe move the wrong way or make any sudden movements. We don't only have a God that is with us, but we have a God that is for us. And the writer Paul makes this point clear when he says, and we know that all, we know that God causes everything to work together. For the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. So that his son would be the firstborn, would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And what shall we say about these things? And that is that if God is for us, who, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? What that means is that God will even bring good out of all the things that you experience. God will bring good out of all things, even tragedies. That means that God literally sees the moment in the struggles or whatever it is that you're going through. And he says, I'm not going to let that have the last word. He'll literally ring it out and say, no, 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 there's no, uh, uh, uh. no, this is not getting, there's something else in here that I can pull. There's something else. I know deep inside there is something else that I can pull out of your disparity. There's something, mm, 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 that, mm, there's something else in here. 
Some of you have been crying for the last 17 days. Some of you have been in the most utter despairing moment of your life. Some of you feel like hope is a long gone pen pal. But I want to let you know that God is looking at your situation. And God is saying, no, 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 no. No, no, there's something else that I can pull out of this. What shall we say then? If God is for me, who can be against me? Your tragedy will not have the last word. And the very last thing that we see in this text is that Jesus has not only the God that is with us, he's not only the God that is for us, but he's also the Jesus that has been us. Born of a teenage mother. Lived in a ghetto called Nazareth. Died as a convicted death row criminal. This is the Jesus that has been us. Fixed to a tree. Hung for all to see. Not just simply as a method of execution, but as a method of terrorism. To inflict the mind of others that might observe and say, if you're like this one, you might get it too. Then we sing the songs, Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm and all is bright. There's a round young virgin, mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild. I said, that's not, that's not the Jesus that I see in this text. That's not the Jesus that appears in this text. We see a Jesus that is on flight. We see a Jesus whose parents come around him at all costs to ensure his safety. We see a family who is continually running from country to country, from city to city, trying to find hope, trying to find a safety net. And what does this Jesus do? He comes back. He comes back. After all of that, he comes back. He comes back. And he lives and he moves and he teaches and he has his being. And then you know what happens? He's executed by the state. And the story ends. But then it ends again. But differently. And I want to encourage you today to know that you may feel that your story is at the end of its rope. But I'm going to tell you this, that it can end again and end differently. God, thank you for being the God that is with us. Thank you for being the God that is for us. Thank you for being the God that has been us. God, I just pray that you would open our eyes to see that you are constantly there even when we feel that we are alone. And God, I thank you for not just simply pulling us out of despair, but getting in the midst of it with us. For you give us hope. For you give us strength. For you give us the image on how to make it and to wade through the waters of wonder by seeing you come out of all that you've done. And if you can do that, we know that you won't leave us in our situation either. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.